Greetings. We return today to our series from 1 Peter, picking up where we left off um, just before the holidays. In the previous section of the letter, 1 Peter 2, 8 to 15, the apostle pointed to Christ's unjust suffering in the flesh as an example for Christian living. The first verse of our current section, which is 1 Peter 3, verses 17 to 22, as we complete the chapter, explains that it is better to suffer for doing good than for doing evil. Here's verse 17 to set the stage. For it is better, if it is the will of God, to suffer for doing good than for doing evil. Why is it better? Because those who do so, like Jesus, will be vindicated in the end. Justice will win out. It is better to suffer for doing good as Christ did, because this is the way to follow him to victory. Because, you see, death is not the final word. Psalm 37 provides one of many promises and examples in the Bible about uh, suffering and being vindicated in the end. Here's what it says. Depart from evil and do good, and dwell forevermore. For the Lord loves justice and does not forsake his saints. They are preserved forever. But the descendants of the wicked shall be cut off. The righteous shall inherit the land and shall dwell in it forever. So what we're seeing right away is that Jesus is the best example of both suffering and triumph. And that goes along with what we saw in 2.21 when Peter said, For to this you were called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that you should follow his steps. So what we need to do is to see how following his steps is following him all the way through um, in suffering, but then, yes, in triumph. So we, uh, we see that as we look at the text before us, and let's pray as we begin our study. Thank you, Father, for the opportunity to be together again. I pray your blessing on your word. I pray, Father, you help us to see what is here and to make application. Illuminate the text, Holy Spirit. This is an uh, oft-debated passage and difficult to interpret. But we ask that you would give us truth and help us, Father, to, be, to live differently because of having learned what you have for us. And we pray it all in Jesus' name. Amen. So I'm going to tell you today, encourage you to rejoice in the Savior's great triumph. First of all, the triumph of his sin payment. Look with me at the first part of verse 18. It says, For Christ also suffered once for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God. It was sin that caused the sinless Christ to die because sin always leads to death. And because he was perfect, he serves as the supreme example of unjust suffering. He was paying for our sin rather than any of his own. It says here his payment was once for all, which is an expression that speaks of perpetual validity, not requiring repetition. Now, this was a new concept for the Jewish people. They were familiar with a sacrificial system that during the annual Passover sacrificed as many as 250,000 sheep. And, of course, the animals were a symbolic atonement for sin. Uh, So the parade of animals driven to the slaughter over the centuries, if it was 250,000 each annual uh, Passover, would have been in the countless millions. And none of these sacrifices took away sin. Not one. They merely covered it, and then only temporarily. As soon as another sin was committed, another sacrifice was needed. So what a radical and wonderful concept is the truth that Christ came and he gave this once-for-all sacrifice on the cross, and forever and ever he has taken care of that for us. There's no need for sacrifices. Now, if you know of Scripture, If you're a student of Scripture, you know that the book of Hebrews talks a lot about this and is a great source for us in talking about the sacrifices and and what Christ did for us as our high priest and so on. Listen to Hebrews chapter 10, for example. This is verses 10, 11, and 12 in that chapter. By that will we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. And every priest stands ministering daily and offering repeatedly the same sacrifices which can never take away sins. But this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down at the right hand of God. You sit down when your job is completed. Atonement had been made. Sin was dealt with in its payment for the the penalty of sin. But 
Christ, as we see here, he didn't just die undeservedly, he died vicariously. Because he, it says, was dying the just for the unjust. It was for our sake. He was taking our place. He was paying the penalty for our wickedness. And Paul says this so well in 2 Corinthians 5, 21, For he, God, has made him, Jesus, to be sin for us, who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. He made Christ, who knew no sin, to be sin for us, that we would be able to have the righteousness of God in our lives. And so that's what he says here in the text back in 1 Peter. The purpose of his offering was to bring us to God. For Christ also suffered once for sins, the just for the unjust, so that he might bring us to God. And the triumph here is that the Father accepted his son's sacrifice, and that every person who trusts in Jesus now is at one with God, received by him, reconciled with him and to him. Now the expression to bring us to God has a rich meaning. It describes someone providing access to another. You see, in ancient courts, access to the king was strictly limited. Someone withstanding was required to verify a person's right to an audience, and they had to formally introduce you to the monarch, or you weren't, you weren't going to get in to see him. And so we see that Christ performs that function for believers. Romans 5, 2 says that we have access by this grace in which we stand, and it's all because of Jesus. We can come boldly to the throne of grace, Hebrews 4 says, because of Jesus. And so it is a triumph because the purpose was to bring us to God, and he has brought us to God. There's a second triumph here, the triumph of Christ's proclamation. And I see that in verses 18 B, the second part there to uh, verse 20. Jesus paid for sin with his death on Calvary, but he wasn't inactive during the three days before he arose, because though his body was dead, his spirit remained alive. Um, there's always some skeptic, skeptic trying to deny the crucifixion, because if Jesus didn't really die, he didn't really rise from the dead. But, but Peter affirms what the entire New Testament attests, that Jesus' body did die on the cross. 18b, it says, um, He was put to death in the flesh, but made alive by the Spirit. So, he did die, and I think we need to explain that and show that, because it's irrefutable. There is proof, there are eyewitnesses, eyewitnesses who weren't, uh, part of, of Jesus' followers by any means, and that were the Roman soldiers. And so I'd like you to take a moment here, if you have your Bible, and turn to John chapter 19 with me. John chapter 19, hold your place here, we'll come back, of course. But in John 19, we see the account of Jesus' crucifixion and what happened that day um, as he was dying for our sins. And there are a couple of facts here. First of all, Christ's physical death was discerned by the, by the soldiers. They, they noticed that they knew it, they recognized it. And that's in 31 to 33. 1931 to 33. Therefore, because it was the preparation day, that the bodies should not remain on the cross on the Sabbath, for that Sabbath was a high day, the Jews asked Pilate that their legs might be broken and that they might be taken away. Then the soldiers came and broke the legs of the first and of the other who was crucified with him. This is important here. When they came to Jesus and saw that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. You see, crucifixion victims postponed their, their death as long as possible by pushing themselves up with their legs to gasp one more breath as they slowly asphyxiated, which is how they were dying. So if you break the legs, there'd be no ability to push up for that additional breath and it would hasten it would hasten their demise. And that's what we read about here. So the, the thieves on either side of Jesus um, were rendered incapable of getting that extra breath, and so they, they died. But these Roman soldiers, hardened warriors who, who recognized death, knew what death looked like, came and they saw, and it says, they saw that Jesus was already dead. So their testimony is true. They wouldn't make this up. They wouldn't try to work with some conspiracy as, as silly notions. People have written silly books through the years about that. Jesus didn't faint on the cross. He didn't swoon. He died physically. His body died. 
And we see that not only was it discerned, it was demonstrated. His physical death was demonstrated in verse 34 here, because just to make sure one of the soldiers pierced Christ's side with his spear. Here's what it says. But one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear, and immediately blood and water came out. The flowing of blood and water was an undeniable physiological sign that Jesus had passed away. And so we see here that his body was dead. He did die. He died for us on the cross. Yeah, we see back in 1 Peter 3.18 that his spirit remained very much alive. Now, although some translations read Jesus was made alive by the spirit, mine actually does that as well. The Greek translation omits the definite article, making this a reference not to the Holy Spirit, but to the Lord's own spirit or to the spiritual realm, uh, the inner life. So we see here that it's talking about not by the spirit, but he was alive in the spirit, uh, or, or alive in spirit, I should say, not the even, in spirit. It's in the body that Christ bore our sins, right? Uh, 1 Peter 2, 24, going back, it says, who himself bore our sins in his own body on the tree, that we, having died to sins, might live for righteousness, by whose stripes you were healed. So it was in the, the body um, that he, he died for us and took our sins upon himself. His spirit was entrusted to the Father just as he breathed his last. You remember from Luke 23, um, his account of the crucifixion, when Jesus had cried out with a loud voice, he said, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. Having said this, he breathed his last. So Peter wasn't referring to the spirit. And I don't think he was talking about the resurrection either. And there is some, that, um, there's a lot of disagreement on this text, as I mentioned in, in, as we prayed, starting, starting our study. But I believe if Peter was referring to the resurrection, he would have said, Christ was put to death in the flesh and then made alive in the flesh. It would have been consistent there, but he doesn't say that. He was put to death in the flesh, in the body, made alive uh, in spirit. And so there's, I, I believe, a clear differentiation between his dead body and his still living spirit. And this is really, it gets really interesting because though his body was dead, Christ's spirit remained alive, but also then, though his body was dead, Christ's spirit remained active. And we see this in verse 19. By whom also he went and preached to the spirits in prison. Um, in which is a better translation than by whom, as I mentioned, because um, the Spirit of God um, is not referenced here in his personhood. It's about the spiritual realm. It's about well, who Christ is in his inner spirit. So in which, uh, 19, I should say, in which also he went and preached to the spirits in prison. In which? In his spirit. In his still living uh, uh, spiritual realm. And so he says here, what happened while his lifeless body lay in the tomb was that Jesus was preaching, preaching, um, or proclaiming to the spirits in prison. Now it says here that Jesus went from one actual place to another. It doesn't say he descended, that's a different word. He says he went to a prison of sorts where he proclaimed, and again the word preach here is not um, evangelizing, it's not giving a sermon about how to be saved, it is proclaiming victory over sin, over death, and over Satan. In so doing, Jesus was performing the, the uh, mission of a herald. A herald was a person in ancient times who would proceed a general returning from a great victory in battle. And he would be calling out to the people in a very public way, proclaiming the great victory of the general or the king that was coming behind them. So he's talking about the, the, the triumph. And what Jesus was doing then during this time was, while his body was in the tomb, was proclaiming his victory to spirits in prison, not, not souls, not human beings. Again, um, that's not the word that Peter uses. So we have to ask ourselves, what's he talking about? Where did, you know, where did he go and, and, and who did he address? And what did he say? Well, we've told you what he said. He was proclaiming victory. In the great spiritual battle between God and Satan, between right and wrong and light and darkness, Jesus has won. And the ones he declares his victory to are these spirits held captive in what Revelation calls the bottomless pit, or the abyss. These are the worst of the worst of the fallen angels, and they're being held over for final judgment to come. So, he, he is speaking to those who are being held 
separately, and we're going to talk about that. The book of Genesis mentions some of these. But let me look at 2 Peter first, okay? 2 Peter 2, 4 gives us some detail, and we'll look at this more when we get to it in the weeks to come. But in 2 Peter 2 and verse 4, For if God did not spare the angels who sinned, but cast them down to hell and delivered them into chains of darkness to be reserved for judgment, and did not spare the ancient world but saved Noah, bringing up Noah again, um, is talking about those who are held over. Not all the fallen angels are captive because they're still at work today. They're the demons uh, that work with the devil and his, his wicked plan. But there are some who were placed into, thrown into this abyss, bottomless pit, and are held there until the greater judgment, final judgment, that is to come. So the particular spirits that I believe Jesus was preaching to included, certainly, um, and, and are speaking of those who disobeyed in the days of Noah. Um, verse 20 says, Who formerly were disobedient, when once the divine long-suffering waited in the days of Noah, while the earth was being prepared. So I believe these are the, the demons the, that left their proper domain and cohabited with human women in Satan's failed attempt to corrupt the human race. Uh, the letter of Jude, the postcard of Jude, talks about this in, in, in verses 6 and 7. And the angels who did not keep their proper domain, but left their own abode, he has reserved in everlasting chains under darkness for the judgment of the great day. As Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities around them in a similar manner to these, having given themselves over to sexual immorality and gone after strange flesh, are set forth as an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. And so we have these angels, these fallen angels, who crossed the line and were, were so uh, disgusting and, and vile that they were placed into uh, judgment in captivity, where in the age to come, all of the uh, demons, all those who do wicked, will be cast into the, to the lake of fire. Now, there's an interesting conversation between Jesus and a demon in the Gospel of Luke, recorded in the Gospel of Luke. And it tells us that to this day, the remaining demons, those who are still free at, at this time, fear the abyss and don't want to be sent into that place, the, the captive prison, where that the Peter refers to. Here's what it says in Luke 8, verses 30 and 31. Jesus asked him, the, 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 uh, the demon, saying, What is your name? And he said, Legion, because many demons had entered him. And they begged him that he would not command them to go out into the abyss. So he's talking here about uh, those demons, those forces of darkness, who thought that they had won because Jesus had been crucified. But he's proclaiming victory to them to show that they're on the wrong side, the wrong team. So it's a triumph of proclamation as he is able to declare this, and I believe he did that um, in, during the three days uh, before the resurrection. Now there's another victory to celebrate here. That's the triumph of Christ's provision, of his sin payment, of his proclamation, of his provision. Um, and that's seen back in our text in, in verse 20 again, the second part in verse 21. So here's what it says here. Let me read the whole verse 20. Who formerly were disobedient when once the divine long-suffering waited in the days of Noah while the ark was being prepared, in which a few, that is, eight souls, were saved through water. In verse 21. There is also an antitype which now saves us. Baptism, not the removal of the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience toward God through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Now again, very... Very uh, difficult, maybe obscure. Um, there, there was no question in, in the minds of the original readers, but there's been a lot of questions since that time as people seek to interpret this. But you need to look at the whole text of Scripture. You need to look at the words that are used and, and the context as well. What we're talking about here is God's patience during Noah's construction of the ark because it reminds us of his forbearance with man's rebellion today. The 120 years required to construct this great boat were one long grace period because as Noah built, he preached, according to 2 Peter 2, 5, where it says, remember, um, he says he was a preacher of, of righteousness 
that God used. So he, as he was building the ark, he was talking about the message of God, warning of judgment to fall, and so on. So the 2,000 years that have transpired since Jesus promised to return are our own society's grace period. I wonder how many more will come to him before it's too late and judgment falls. Now, it says here in verse 21 that there is an antitype. In, in the New Testament, an antitype is an earthly expression of a heavenly reality. There's a connection, but it's uh, an earthly example or expression of what is true. It's a symbol or an analogy of spiritual truth. What is the antitype here? Well, I, I don't think it's the flood by itself. I think it's the, the, the entire experience of Noah and his family as it relates to the ark. I think what it's saying here is that the preservation of those in the ark is analogous to our preservation in Christ. And that's the thing that saves us in verse 21. Uh, again, 20 he said that they were saved through water, through the water. They were, they were placed into the ark of safety, only eight souls, and everybody else came under deserved judgment. And so he says that preservation in an ark, when surrounded by the judgment of the wicked, is an antitype, is a picture of the spiritual reality of our salvation, and that's the provision Christ uh, he came to seek and to save that which was lost. He provides salvation, and that's what saves us in verse 21. Um, don't be confused by it. It says there is an, also an antitype which now saves us, and this is baptism. The antitype that, that saves us is Christ, as I just mentioned. Baptism, water baptism, doesn't save anybody, despite what the verse seems to indicate and what some falsely teach. Peter goes to great pains to make that clear in this same verse. Remember I read that for you in 21. He says, the thing that now says is baptism, not the removal of the filth of the flesh, not water baptism, but the answer of a good conscience toward God, which comes through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. It isn't, it isn't water that saves us. It is placing our trust in the one who died and rose again, which provides for us a good conscience before him. So it's not saying water baptism saves us. Look, the word baptize means to immerse. And in its simplest and purest form, it means to plunge in. It means to, to, to drown, if you will. It, it's, it, it's, it's not speaking of water all the time. That's got to be seen by the context. And so what he's talking about here is not water baptism, not immersed in water, but there is a figurative immersion. He's talking about that here. It is an immersion. It is a placement into Christ as the ark of safety, sailing over God's judgment on the wicked. Now, we know that because of what he, Peter himself says. He said, no, 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 no. Don't, don't get the idea that I'm saying baptism saves you. I'm not talking about water baptism that, that, that cleanses you. I'm talking about the whole thing of what Christ has done for us. Throughout the, his letter, he said that salvation comes through faith alone. Throughout the New Testament, uh, we see this as well. So don't take this one thing and you see the word baptize and those that are looking to build a case have this little proof text. It isn't proving your case, my friend. You need to look deeper and look at the whole of Scripture. So we're seeing here that Jesus is our ark, which is a beautiful picture for us. Just as Noah obeyed God by climbing into a boat to save a few, Jesus obeyed his Father by climbing onto a cross to save many. And what victory is ours? Because of the triumph of Christ's eternal deliverance of all who come to him. Oh, we rejoice in the triumph of Christ's sin payment. We rejoice in the triumph of of his proclamation of what he had done, of his victory. We re rejoice in the triumph of his provision. And finally, we, we rejoice in the triumph of Christ's position. And that's what we see in verse 22, the final verse of the text and the final verse of the chapter. Jesus now enjoys the supremacy that he had before his incarnation, his final triumph over all creation. And that's something that 22 alludes to, as I mentioned. Here we go. Um, uh, through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who has gone into heaven and is at the right hand of God, angels and authorities and powers having been made subject to him. The right hand is the place of prestige, honor, and power. And this is where our, our Lord sits right now. Not at the right hand of an of a earthly king, which would be seen in the Bible as prestigious and powerful, 
but at the right hand of God, because he is God as well. And he has this place of prominence and position. And this is the fulfillment of Philippians chapter 2, where our exalted Lord has been given the name which is above every name, a name at which every knee shall bow of those in heaven and of those on earth and of those under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. No, I, I titled the message God's Winning Team because, listen, folks, if you're trusting in Christ today, one day you will triumph with him. You will triumph because of him because the scripture says in 2 Timothy 2, and this is such a beautiful way to end, it's so encouraging to us, 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 11 and 12, write it down, look it up, 2 Timothy 2, 11 and 12, he says, For if we died with him, we shall also live with him. If we endure, we shall also reign with him. Wow. Child of God. Because of Jesus, we're on God's winning team. So be encouraged. Stand strong. Stay in the game for your benefit and for the benefit of those around us who need to hear what we have and receive who lives in us. Well, interesting stuff here in Peter, and I hope that you'll take it to heart that you make application to your life by the Holy Spirit. And we're out of time here, so we'll see you next time.